One of the beautiful things about being at Lincoln Square Mall in Urbana and attending the Urbana location is that when we have meetings over there, oftentimes people like to look into the glass and see what's going on. And I'm a people watcher. Anybody else like to people watch? Okay. And whenever you walk up to some sort of glass or some sort of entryway, oftentimes you can see some sort of reflection. And you'll see people that will turn and, you know, not me, but, you know, check out their hair or whatever, you know, or make sure there's nothing in their teeth or whatnot. Or my favorite is always when little kids come up, you know, and like they're acting out something or being some superhero. It just makes me laugh because the truth of the matter is when they walk up to that glass, they don't see because of their own reflection, they don't see what's on the other side of it. They don't see what's happening. And it's just great to see either the excitement or the energy or what's going on in some people's thoughts as they look into a mirror because everybody has kind of a different approach. Some of us go to kind of evaluate ourselves, you know, kind of do a quick checkpoint, you know, how's my hair, how's my teeth, how's my shirt, does it look okay? Um, you know, some of us go up and we try and just make sure that we're put together for a meeting, whatever it is, we evaluate ourselves. But a mirror, oftentimes, especially when we're talking from a spiritual sense, a mirror is often the times that we look beyond the facade, beyond the outward appearance, and we start to look to the soul of ourselves, right? Who are we when nobody else is looking? Who, who are we when you press in deep down inside? What is our life really about when we, when we pause to reflect our life, who are we becoming? And that's really where we're going with a lot of this discussion. The, the mirror is going to be a metaphor that we're going to use much of this series called Fully Known. And there's a, this series, big idea that we're going to unpack, and it's just this overall truth, that we are fully known by Jesus to reflect transformed lives. That's what we're about. We are fully known by Jesus to reflect transformed lives. Now, what does that mean to be fully known? You know, Scripture reminds us that God knows every hair on our head, knows so much about us, knows who we are, our personality, our, our greatest weaknesses, our greatest strengths. But being fully known by God is not only just an, an, an intimacy thing of God knowing us deep down inside, but God also fully knows the journey that we're a part of. Because God, being flesh, being Jesus, came and walked this earth and experienced the struggles and the trials that many of us do. All the temptations, all the wrestling points, Jesus walked through that. And ultimately, his death, burial, and resurrection, the burden of carrying the sins of humanity, he's gone to greater lengths even to understand the journey that we're a part of. And so this series, as we begin to think about it, we understand that part of why God knows us is because God is trying to create in us his character that reflects to the world around us so that the world might come to know him. And when we look deeply into ourselves, using this metaphor, so to speak, of reflection, we understand this, that we reflect what we truly believe, right? Our lives reflect what we truly believe, what we truly value, what we say is authentically true about ourselves. And so for many of us that have put our, our paw in the air and say, yeah, we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, the challenge becomes, does your life reflect that? Or when we peer into the mirror of our souls, what do we say are the values? What are the things that are really being project, projected from ourselves about our work, about our play, about our home, our marriage, our wallet? What does it say about who we are and the character that we share? I want to encourage everyone, if you've not had a chance to grab this booklet, uh, you have seen it probably out front, but there is a booklet for you if you would like to grab one. And this booklet, fully known, is to help you take this uh, series with us and have a weekly conversation about it. Uh, matter of fact, there are places where you can take sermon notes. Uh, there's places in here where you can do a daily journal. We've taken some key words per chapter that help you understand this book, First Peter. But the challenge is this. When people ask, what is the most transformative tool to help us grow our faith? There is nothing as significant as reading scripture. Studies will tell you that you're wrestling with anxiety, your personal identity, the crises of your life, your priorities. Nothing more significantly transforms the walk of a person than to surrender it before scripture. And so in this, our goal is not just to have you follow along so you kind of have an idea of where we're going. This is, for lack of better terms, it's a desire to help you cut your own meat. 
everybody wants to come to church and be fed. I get that. I get that. But I don't know that that's the goal of God. The goal of God is for all of us as mature believers or maturing believers to be able to cut our own stake and to feed ourselves. And so this is one of the tools that we put in your hands because we want you to grow and to mature and to be able to be walking in your own faith because we're reflecting something that matters for all of eternity. We're reflecting the very character of God. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to go ahead and open up to 1 Peter. 1 Peter is in the New Testament. It's towards the latter portion of your Bible. It's not a very long book. It's only five chapters long, but it's written by a man whose name is Peter. Now, Peter is a significant character in the New Testament. He's one of the early apostles, which means that he was invited by Jesus to be a part of his early ministry and his early mission. He was close in proximity and relationship to Jesus, so much of the teaching, much of the dynamic ministry that Jesus did, Peter is right there beside Jesus. Now, Peter is known as being a little bit of a hothead. I identify with that, okay? Kind of shoots from the hip, a little bit bold and brash in who he is. But what we understand about Peter is that Peter, in all of his zeal for chasing God, had a very genuine desire to be transformed by God. His zeal sometimes got him into situations where he overreacted or acted out in ways that were not godly. But ultimately, the forgiveness and the restoration of Jesus shaped in him him a boldness to share his faith, even in the most difficult of circumstances. And so 1 Peter is penned to a group of Christians that are actually dispersed. There there is persecution going on in the region at this time. And so even living your Christian faith is not something that's applauded or encouraged. There's actually suffering and struggling that's going on because of that. So Peter pens this, this letter a letter of urgency, a letter of new perspective to help remind young Christians about the value of the sacrifice of Jesus and how it permeates every portion of their lives. Peter chapter one, we're gonna start there today and we're gonna look at at the first chapter. But here's where we start in verse three, if you will. Let's follow along. Here's what it says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy... He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, never spoil, and never fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation, meaning the second coming of Jesus, that is already to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice. And listen to this next few words. And all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Right away, Peter's trying to give us a, a perspective, right? Let's, let's raise our reality of where we are, that as Christians, we celebrate the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it is the anthem of hope by which we live our lives. And so if that truth is true, and we believe it is, that the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ has provided the forgiveness of our sins and life everlasting, then every one of us who put our hand in the air because of the work of God should have a sense of confidence that there is more to our life than just what's around us. There's a greater perspective of what's at stake. So what Peter begins to press into is he begins to press into these words like um, salvation, new birth, inheritance. Peter's trying to give this portrait of that every one of us were once sinners before God, but because of what God has done through Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are now a new birth. There has been a transformation in our lives. And so because of this new birth in us, We are not who we were, but we are who God is making us, who we're becoming. We begin to understand this idea that while God fully knows us, has given his life for us, there is reason and there is purpose for us, even in the most difficult times. Here's the reality that Peter is trying to press into. We are fully known by Jesus to have new life. 
The goal of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was to close the chasm between humanity and God. The sin rebellion that had separated us was paid for in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's that hope that now propels us. It moves us forward. But he gives it to us. He gives this to us so that as we go through these trials, we might be refined and reformed into his likeness. Now, let me, let me, ask, you, uh, uh, let me ask this of you this way. When you think about the relationships that matter most to you, who are they? Who are the people that you think about that you go, oh, they, that, that, that's, that's the relationship that matters to me. I would guess, just a hunch, that the relationships that you value more than anything else are the relationships that stood by you in difficult times that helped you through a difficult time. Someone who saw you in your weakness and failure and walked with you through that time until you were able to get back on your own feet, right? I mean, nobody really values fair weather fans while we all have them, right? We all have people that just kind of hang up and show up when we've got, you know, and when we're hosting a party, they show up. But when you need to move, right? 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 The reality is we have people around us that we, we, we love and we care for, but it's only in those struggles, it's only in the hardship, it's only in the difficulty that we start saying, this friend, this relationship really matters. And so it is with our faith. When it comes to a genuine, authentic faith before God, it is proven, it is tested, it is refined in the hardships of life. That's why Peter goes on to say this in verse 7, right? These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed, the the second coming, the returning of Jesus. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not know him, You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So Peter begins to press into the, here's the reality. Life is hard. And when life is hard, what, what those hardships and those trials provide is a chance for the authenticity and the genuineness of your faith to grow. Now, if you, if you called me out, let's say you would do this for whatever reason and thought that I was disingenuous or not authentic. I mean, let's take something simple like my appreciation of the Arizona Cardinals, right? If you said, oh, Shafter, you're probably just a bandwagoner uh, because they made it to a Super Bowl. I, I'd have to throw down. I'd have to bust your chops. I'd, no, okay. I, I wouldn't do that, right? But I, I, would, I would say, you have no idea who I am. You have no under, understanding that when, when I was in third grade, I watched the St. Louis Cardinals beat the Dallas Cowboys, and that was my transformative moment before God. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I do appreciate the Emmett Smith, though. And I'm sorry we ruined his career for two years. Anyway, I digress. The truth of the matter is, this is something that's very personal to me. And Peter is trying to say this. To have an inauthentic and a a less than genuine faith may be to have no faith at all. That faith is really valuable when you go through hardships and when you go through trials. And this world is difficult. And so because we have this faith, because we know God is at work with us, we're going to continue to keep a perspective of praise and glory of what God is doing in us and through us. See, Peter is doing some reflecting and it begins to project what his life is about. When we reflect back, when we look back on the salvation that God has given us, it begins to press us into the heart of what this letter is ultimately about. How do you live in a society that you feel like an outsider? How do you live your faith when things are going wrong? How do you become the refined project that God wants you to be, a person in him, without going through hardship? It's difficult. The easy road does not shape 
Christians into their Christ. It's only through the struggle and hardship. That's why he says this in verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Are, are you noticing that Peter is speaking with a perspective that Jesus Christ will return? Jesus Christ will return. Jesus Christ will return. Well, what we will all stand before God one day. So as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, but just as he who called you is holy, meaning God, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. You know, as Christians, we do live in a difficult time, and oftentimes it's easier to blend in or to fit in than to stand out. Oftentimes when we talk about this, this word holiness, oftentimes people jump to morality, you know? We make the joke, right? I don't smoke, drink, or chew or grow out with girls that do, right? We, like, like we're trying out for an Eagle Scout badge or something, right? But that's not what holiness is in and of itself. Yes, there is a sense of morality, but when we think of holiness, we need to realize that God is calling us to live in the whole character of him, not just in love and grace, but as in truth and justice, meaning that there is a refinement of our own character to surrender ourself and look more like our Savior. But holiness, or to be holy as God is holy, is the idea of living out the whole character of God in every area of our lives, from the way that we eat, we think, act, and speak. That every relationship, every priority that we would have would be surrendered before God and say, God, what would you do? How would you have your way in that relationship? It's the whole character of God. But holiness is not only about God's character, it's about his mission, his will. That we would reflect the full character of God and we would live the full mission or purpose of God. That as people who have said we believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we would be the kind of people that would not only begin to be refined into God's character, but we would surrender our lives in such a way as say, God, have your way in me. Your will, not my will. Your way, not my way. And so you think about the implications of that. It begins to confront the very things of you know, our, our home life, our marriages, our relationships. It begins to confront the way that we work, the way, the, the way we treat people at work, the way we, we treat people where we play. It, it begins to impact the way we leverage our wallet, the way we speak about one another, the way we care for those who are oppressed. All of this begins to be shaped because as we're growing in the whole character of God, we are even surrendering to the whole mission and purpose of God. His will, his way on earth as it is in heaven. Peter presses in over the next few verses, and what he does is he gives a challenge that we have kind of four values that we're going to hold above everything else, and holiness is that value that holds it together. But because God is refining us into his character, we have a hope. We are reminded of what God does. There is a reverence that we live out in our lives that it, if God is truly God and I am not, then there is a surrendering of myself that God wants to do in me so that we might love. Hope, holiness, reverence, and love all go together as part of the refinement process to become who God needs us and calls us to be. But let's be honest. Here's what, here's what nobody ever really says to us, right? When we become a Christian, nobody ever really stops and says, you know what? The days of fitting in and blending in are over. We oftentimes have Baptism Sunday here, and it's a great celebration, and when we come to that, to that, that trough, that, that baptismal, we come to baptize, to bury our lives in Christ, to live in the newness of him. Really what we're saying in that moment is not only, God, thank you for all that you've given and I accept your forgiveness. I will live because of the forgiveness of sins that you offer me and the gift of the Holy Spirit. What we are also saying is, and God, now I sign up to live my life in a way that's different than the rest of the world. It's for your glory. It's for your honor. And I think that's part of the reason why sometimes as Christians, 
When suffering happens or hardships happen or things don't go the way we think they should as Christians, we get mad. We get mad. Because for some of us, we have made a transaction with God for a better life rather than surrendering our life so that God can have his way in us. And so Peter is trying to set a new perspective and say, hey, 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 if you've given your life to Christ and life is difficult, this is not something to be afraid of or to shy away from. It is something to lean into because it is in these moments of hardship and struggle that you are now going to be shaped into his likeness. Here's what it says in verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have a sincere love for who? Each other. I mean, this is partly what's at stake, right? My maturity and growth before God either enables and empowers our love for each other or we snuff it out. Let me read that again. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and the enduring word of God. Can I be honest with you for a second? I think most of us, when we hit hard times and trials, the first thing we do is turn inward, don't we? We cocoon ourselves. And sometimes what happens is we find ourselves very, 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 very alone in some very difficult times. And it is true God is with you. And it is true that God is for you. But the perpetuation of always turning inward through hard times creates a callousness in Christians that we quit reaching out and loving others. The vulnerability that Peter is calling us towards in this point is a love of God and a love of others. And when we continue to turn inward to ourselves, we begin to isolate and exclude not only God's work in us, but the very mission and impact that we could have on the people around us. So Peter is making it very clear. God has given you so much more than you could ask or imagine, and life is hard. They are not disconnected. They go hand in hand. So that the gift that God has given you might sustain you to refine you so that even in the midst of difficult times, your ability to love God and to love the people around you would grow and flourish. When we do that, we're able to reflect God's character even in the most difficult of circumstances. Here's what 1 Peter 1 really teaches us this. As disciples of Jesus... Followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus are called to reflect Jesus. So what does your life reflect when it gets difficult? What do your posts on Facebook say about your character or who you are when life is hard? What do the conversations around the water cooler reflect about you when life is difficult? Now, this is not a message series to talk about how we're just going to slap a Jesus bumper sticker on everything when life is hard. But what we are going to do as Christ followers, we're going to be genuine about the struggle that we're found in. And we're going to be authentic about the work of what God is doing in the midst of us. And even in the trials and circumstances where life is more than we can seem to bear, we are going to trust that God is at work in each and every one of us. And in doing so, in keeping our hope in Christ and allowing him to shape his character in us and around us and to live in a reverence of fear and understanding respect that God is ultimately in control, our ability to love will grow stronger even in times of trial. So let me just ask you, what kind of faith do you want? 
When you begin to look at your life and the hardships that you're a part of and the struggles that you've been again been a part of, what, what kind of faith do you want? Do you want a faith that fades when things get difficult or a faith that stays even in the greatest of hardships? Do you want a faith that, that praises even God in the midst of difficult times or do you want a faith that pouts because life didn't go your way? Do you want a faith that you can stand firm in or a faith that's flimsy and melts under pressure? Is your faith something that you value or is it something that's cheap? Every moment in our lives is a chance to reflect the faith that refines us. And I think every one of us want to reflect the very character of Jesus as much as we can. We're not trying to be the people who, who shy away from, but the reality is sometimes life is more difficult more often than we want. And it can be exhausting. But I can encourage you, and I can assure you, if ultimately it is for God's glory and God's credit that you are going through something, and you are allowing God to shape you in the midst of that, you will come out stronger on the other side. You will be refined and reformed. You will be reshaped. You will be built together in a way that when the next trial comes and the next hardship comes, you will be able to stand with confidence that it has been God, it always is God, and it is for God that your life has its purpose. What you've just experienced through 1 Peter 1 is kind of a, a cadence that plays out all throughout 1 Peter. Through almost every chapter, it's this cadence that plays out. Peter will declare a reality. This is who we're called to be. He will share the implications of what happens when that reality is true. And then there will be a challenge, a call to obedience. Let me say it this way. Here's the cadence. From reality to implications to a call of obedience that plays out over and over and over through 1 Peter. Now, I know most of us love a message that's about God's love and God's grace and God's encouragement. And sometimes a message with strong truth like this can seem overwhelming. But when we begin to press into this passage, as we begin to press in to the truth that's found in 1 Peter, we will be reminded of this reality that we have been sinners. The implication is that we need a savior and ultimately we are called to have faith in Jesus alone. Why? Because life is messy and lives are not perfect. So we have to lean into our identity in Jesus. And when we have faith in Jesus, there's a call to, to baptism, to surrender our lives before him. And so we need to begin to be prepared to be the kind of people that will live out God's obedience in every area of our lives. Whatever it is in your journey, whatever it is in your walk, when hardship comes, when trials appear, don't run away. Press in. Trust that God is at work and allow the one who deserves the praise for the very salvation that we claim to work in us, to refine us, so that our ability to serve and love and live the mission of Jesus begins to permeate every portion of our world. Let's move to a time of response. We use this mirror as a, as a quick illustration. And I think when you do a message like this, sometimes you pause and you... We look into the mirror for a moment and we just begin to take in what we see. It's easy to get caught in the facade of our lives, get caught in the blame of things that have gone wrong. It gets easy to get caught in who did what and who didn't do what. It gets easy to blame, it gets, gets easy to just get so focused on ourselves and the physical of what we see. I mean, when we look in the mirror, we see less of who we used to be, bad decisions about health over years. We see insecurity in our eyes, vulnerability that we've tried to keep hidden. 
And for many of us, that's just a normal conversation with the mirror. But if we could look past the facade of what we see in this earthly shell, and we could peer into who God sees in the midst of us, the very nature and the character of who God wants us to be and is calling us to be, if we could peer in and begin to understand that God not only sees so much more in us than just our ability or our talents or the uh, opportunity to make money or the girl on our arm or the car that we drive, if, if we could look in and we could just see for ourselves that the brokenness that we, we try and hide could be made whole, if we could see that some of the impurities of our heart, the the greed, the envy, the anger, the things that, the things that cloud us from fully living out our walk with God, if we, could, if we could see those things, we would recognize that God is, God is allowing the hardships of our lives to maybe bring those to the surface. I mean, don't get me wrong. I would, I would love to look in this mirror and see someone who looks like he was when he was 17. But that 17-year-old kid, all he ever saw was himself. All he ever saw was himself in the, in the sports that he played, the music that he performed, the girls that he dated, the jobs that he had. All he ever saw in a mirror was himself. And I don't know about you, but I want to see more. I want to go beyond the facade of what everybody can see. And I want to become the person that God created me to be. And so that 17-year-old kid, that 16-year-old kid who is full of himself and so full of pride and zeal, it doesn't just walk away from him. I don't just stop being that kid. It takes difficult times. It takes honest conversation. It takes failure, vulnerability, obedience before God, repentance of who I was, trust to take steps forward. And if there's anything that I believe First Peter is going to teach us is that God is not only at work around us, but God is at work in us. In our identity, in our value, and who we are deep down is not going to be measured by the car that we drive, the home that we own, the girl on our arm, the money in our wallet, the job that we have, the friends that we're surrounded by, the likes on our social media, none of that. It is rooted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That gives us a hope to endure, to persevere, to be strengthened. You know, we live in a sports town. I always love sports cliches. They're so good for discipleship, but nobody really wants to use them, right? Just do it. That'd be a great Christian slogan, you know? Just be obedient. Just do it. That makes sense. No pain, no gain. That's awesome, you know? But when it comes to our walk with Jesus, just doing it, or no pain, no gain, we press away from that. And I want to dare you. I want to dare you to be a part of the next four weeks and allow Scripture to speak into your soul as you begin to see a group of Christians that in that early first century, they weren't just disliked. They were arrested. They were beaten. They were taken advantage of because they claimed to follow the way of Jesus. And in those difficult times of suffering, while they were in roles of government or in roles of relationship or roles of business, while they felt oppression, God continued to grow up in them his character beyond the physical facade to a depth of genuineness and authenticity. So I'll dare you. How about you grab a book? How about you jump into the word? And how about you join us for the next four weeks and see... See how God takes all the battles and all the struggles, all your weaknesses, and begins to work through them. And let's see how God grows us through his word 
through our obedience to become the people that not only love him even more, but live as a movement of love in the community that we're a part of. just a moment, we're going to move to these stations. If you're a guest with us, this is probably different. I don't know if you have a faith tradition or not, but we play some songs, and as we do, people spontaneously move to three different stations. They come to these benches for prayer. They move to the tables where there's a candle, the ones that are closest to them, to take communion. Communion is It's commemorating and celebrating the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are invited to go to that table to eat the bread and drink the juice. And then several will go to the give and respond boxes. Maybe you've got a decision that you're making today. Maybe you're ready to get baptized. Maybe you want to talk with someone or uh, pray with somebody about part of the journey and the struggle that you're going through right now but you can take the connect card that's in front of you and the chair seat back in front of you and fill that out and put it in one of the give and respond boxes. There are four of them around the room or give of your tithes and offerings. But we call this time our response time because we believe that through, through our singing, through the preaching, through our prayer and communion, God is ultimately calling us all to respond in obedience. That what we do here would be the reality we live out there that our surrendered life would make way for his will and his way in us. As we get ready for our time today, Aaron's going to lead us in a song. The words are going to be up there. You're not going to know them. It's a brand new song. But we're going to sing it over the next few weeks, and we just felt like the message and the theme of where we're going to try and go the next few weeks is going to press in a little bit differently. And so we want you to learn this song today. We want you to hear this song today. And so as the words are sung and the words are on the screen, would you, would you read them? Would you pray over them? Would you make it your prayer before God that he would have his way in us, that he would become greater and we would become less? I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand. And as Aaron starts off with this first song, if you, if you feel prompted to come pray or to go to communion or to give of your tithes and offerings, you can do that. But for most of us, I'd love for us just to stand and listen, to take these words in, and then as we continue with our singing, move, respond.